<laughs> See me after class, it's about school, it's about school. Not about education. So now, you may have heard of this, uh, this young man. Uh, he, uh, as I said, is in charge of uh, president of the Illinois Prince Chicago Principal Association. Um, he, formerly principal of Blaine Elementary in Lakeview, uh, a committed educator, and um, I just, I don't know how I convinced him to do this, but here he is. Please give a warm good evening welcome to Troy LaRavia. <laughs> It's a talk show. You need a microphone. Okay. I wanted to do a whole morning announcements bit. Um, but, you know, enough about me. Um, I'm going to consult my notes here because uh, this isn't, you know, this isn't, I'm not being tested. Okay. I'll get mine out, too. All right, good. Thank you. I know you were, I, I, we, we talked the other day at Troy's workplace. And um, he was kind enough to sit there and listen to me go on for a couple hours. Yeah, it was literally a couple hours. It was. <laughs> it definitely was. I was like, wow, man, I kind of think of my five. Thanks so much for talking. Hey, whoa! I got a, you have a job. What are, what are you doing talking to me? Um, seriously, thanks for being here. Um, you know, <laughs> I want, you know, I think everyone is pretty familiar with your background in terms of what got you into the headlines as of late. You were a principal of a CPS school. Yes. You did not agree with uh, certain policies of Chicago public schools, um, I think in terms of teachers and uh, allocation of resources, which we can get to a little more of. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to talk about you, Troy. Yes, sir. You as a person, who you are, the man behind the headlines. This is the point where I stop talking and ask you, um, you're from the south side of Chicago? That's right, all over. You uh, were in the Navy as well? Yes, I was. And after you got out of the Navy, how did you get into college? Were you excited? You're like, finally, I'm done with the Navy. I'm going to go to school. This is going to be, I can't wait. This well, is exciting. Well, the whole reason I went to the Navy was to avoid college. I oh. got out of high school. <laughs> I left high school, and I didn't think I could, I had what it takes to succeed in college. So the Navy was, in part, a way to avoid that. Um, you know, I didn't want to keep working in fast food, and I didn't think I could succeed in college, so I joined the Navy. Uh, when I got out, I had a girlfriend uh, who I'd known since I was seven years old, and she had gone to the University of Illinois, and she convinced me to apply to college. And I was petrified of failure, uh, but I did it because she kept pushing. Uh, and she was taking a class where she was reading this book, and she had just finished the book. And she gave it to me. And I sat there and I held that book in my hand. And I remember staring at the cover of it. And when I read it, 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 it changed everything for me. It was the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, and seeing how he transformed his own life gave me the sense that like, there's a blueprint here that I could, I, I'm better than what I am right now. I could become, I could succeed. And so I left, I, I, I put that book down and I went and bought two more books. One was about black history and culture, and the other one was called How to Get Straight A's. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't come up the other day. I didn't realize you cheated, Troy. So I studied it, and I did everything it said. First semester, straight A's. It was just about habits, you know? Habits of mind, habits of, you know, go to every class, sit in front of the class, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, simple habits that I developed. Straight A's first semester, straight A's second, straight A's third. Now, remember after that third semester, I'm looking at my grade report and I thought, I almost didn't come here. I have straight A's at the University of Illinois in Champaign and Urbana for three straight semesters, and I almost didn't come here. I didn't think I could measure up. There's it it a racial component to it in terms of what the society tells you about yourself as a black man. Um, and I decided, like, what was it that, I asked the question, what was it that gave me such a low assessment of myself? Um, and I, it was a lot in terms of the society I grew up in, but one that I felt I could control was school. And it, at that moment, I made the decision to become a teacher. 
And I had it in my mind that no one who came through my classroom was going to leave my classroom not understanding their potential, their, their full human potential, the way I didn't understand mine. And so I became a teacher. I got trophies just for showing up. <laughs> to say, up. way to come to class, great job! You're doing so good! And so I didn't do my homework, so I already had a trophy. I wish um, all my interviews went like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I watched them all, and I mean, guys, it's La Ravie. That's it. La Ravie. <laughs> Ready? La Ravie. We're here with embattled CPS principal Troy Lorever. <laughs> How did you That's get into journalism? Do. You can't speak. I don't understand. So, La you, Revere is the most common mispronunciation. La Revere? From journalists. La Revere. I get that one a lot. Well, see, I'm not a journalist, so I, I got that going. <laughs> uh, but please, uh, please don't, please. Um, so, you decided to become a teacher, you That's made right. that choice. And you went forth, and so you became a teacher. You studied to become a teacher. You became qualified to become a teacher. And then you were a teacher for your first year in Bronzeville. That's right. It's 1997. That's right. Let me see if I get this right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Social promotion is underway. That's right. Children well, the are. The end of social promotion is underway. The end of social promotion. So we have two classes of sixth graders. Three. But we had two first. Maybe just tell it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> you got all the troublemakers. So they were trying to, it was the first, in the social promotion, for the first time they were going to fail large groups of kids and hold them back. And there was this large group of sixth graders, about 15 of them, and they had three classes of sixth graders who passed from fifth grade, and they had this group of sixth graders who had not passed, and they were trying to figure out, are we going to distribute them throughout the classroom, the classes, or are we gonna keep them in one class, in their minds, to let the other three classes focus and learn, and keep those, keep these troublemakers in a class by themselves. And so they decided to go with that last option. And then they decided to take the fifth graders who had passed, but who were behavior problems and add them to that class. And they thought it was a great idea to give this class to a first year teacher. <laughs> Whose name was? Troy LaRavier. <laughs> that was my first teaching experience, that class. And I remember the first day, I mean, it was rough. And I remember there was this little girl named Patrice. And Patrice was an, I mean, she, she was a piece, she was disrespectful, she was defiant, she had an attitude, she talked back. And at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm, I'm calling her mother, right? I'm, I'm gonna call her mother, like, I'm gonna teacher. show her, right? I'm a teacher and I'm gonna call her mother. I couldn't get in touch with the mother, and this school serves the Ida B. Wells Projects. Um, and I decide, all right, I'm gonna go over to the projects. And they got the row houses and the tall buildings. She lived in one of the tall buildings. And so I go up the elevator, it's the pissy smell I remember from my childhood, living in the slums. And I go to her door and it's open. And there's a baby in a crib by itself. And I knock, hello, and I walk in. And then finally this woman comes out and she is completely inebriated. She's about 60 years old. It's three o'clock in the afternoon and I can smell, you know the smell of an alcoholic when you can smell it from their pores. And she's, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm, my name is Troy LaRavier. I'm a teacher at Doolittle East. She's in my class. I'm trying to find her parents. And she's like, oh, well, her mother locked up for, uh, her mother and locked up and her father in jail too. Both of them in there on drug charges. And she just, and I'm thinking, it's just me and Patrice. There's no mother to rely on. There's no father. It's just me and Patrice. This is the life she lived in. No wonder she come into class like this. That, and, and it was one of the first times where I began to get the sense that there's this bigger thing, like it's like you, that, it's one, there's these things outside of schools that control and impact the achievement of kids that teachers just don't have any kind of influence over and can't. Um, and that our city is still
killing these people. Her family, her family, for example, her father and mother are locked up because of this mass incarceration policy that we're talking about today. Right? right? It's policy that's messing her life up. Anyway, it was a, it was a rough start, uh, but I ended up having a good year. And at the end of that year, I'm thinking, you know, I came in, I came in, you heard my story, right? You're in the beginning, right? I'm gonna make sure these kids, you know, I had all this motivation. But teaching is more important, it's more than motivation. It's more than belief. It is a profession that requires a deep knowledge of the content and skills behind what makes you a good teacher, like a doctor, right? You know, it's not this Teach for America thing where you just get all these well-meaning people. You have to be well-trained and knowledgeable. And so I left and I went back to get a master's degree. Uh, at the University of Illinois. Wait, 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 wait. So you finish your first year of teaching. That's right. And you go, nah, I don't know enough. And you go back to school. That's exactly to what learn I did. More. Yeah. I first of all, I think I got that story pretty much right. Yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> you know, I was confused. I mean, it's okay. That's all right. That's all right. It's late. It's late. We're all tired. It's okay. Right. Right. It's okay. Um, so what? I mean, okay. So you went back to school to learn more. And then you went back to teach after that? Right. I, was in, I did my master's in two years. And then I had an advisor, a professor, who liked my writing. And so she said, stick around for a PhD. And so I stuck around for that. But I never finished. I got the bug to go back and teach. So I taught in a middle school in Champaign-Urbana. It was the, and I always have this kind of, like, I want to find the poorest school with the heaviest minority population. Kids who are like me, who need someone like, but I thought like me. Um, that's, I wanted to give my energy to that kind of kid, kids who needed most. And so I found the school that had that kind of population. And Champaign was very integrated. They had the school that was about half black, a lot of minority kids. And my second year was completely different than my first because of what the skills that I had gained and what they used uh, when I went through my grad program. So There's I, a lot of things you got at grad school where you said, why didn't I hear, read this? Like, well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm in grad school and I'm learning these things. And it's different in grad school because you have a year of teaching behind you now. And so I'm learning things that I go, man, I wish I would have known this. I wish I would have known that when I was teaching. Uh, and so I wanted to go back and try. And I went back and I had a great year. I had a principal in my second year was trying to get me to do professional development for the staff that was there. It was that good a year. But I'm in Champaign. And I'm like, this is not going to work. I'm not going to know I'm succeeding until I go back to Chicago. And so I get a job at debt school on the west side and had a great third year. And after that year at debt, I had a friend, Dr. David Stovall at UIC, who we went to, we went to undergrad together and laid a PhD program together. He was working at Social Justice High School. And I'm like, Social Justice High School? <laughs> and I loved where I was, but I'm like, God, social, like I have to try that out. That's my thing, right? And so I got an interview. They hired me as a teacher. I had a great first year there. I had a, such a good year, especially in terms of culture and climate. Kids who would be in the hall or in another classroom behaving in a way where we would not want them, but did not act that way when they came into my classroom. It was kids, some of the roughest kids would be coming to my classroom and, what's up, dad? Like, that was what they called me, dad. It was almost a face-saving mechanism for them to tell other folks, we treat, we, we act right here because we have a special relationship with him. And then, I, mean, I want to make a distinction right. there because I think everyone had that teacher in school where you'd be goofing off and that one teacher would walk in and you'd go, <laughs> and you 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 focus up, but it seemed to be different than what. That's not the relationship you had. It's not to be like, oh, look out for Troy Lerovier. He's going to discipline you. It's like I'm excited to go to his class. I'm learning things. I'm engaged as a student. I'm telling it other was students. Both. It was learned. all of it. It was both. Okay. It was all all of it. I mean, they knew. They knew. You know, I inspect what I expect. If I say bam, I'm like. If I say do X, they know I'm going to be. <laughs> and if you're not, it'll get addressed, right? Uh, but they also knew why I was doing it. They knew I cared about it. I had those conversations with kids. I wish I could go through some of them. But we I had that. such a really yeah. good first yeah. year that they made me assistant principal the next year so that I could help impact the environment, and that's what I did. So uh, after the first year of teaching, you say, I don't know anything. I'm going back to school. After your second year of teaching, after getting your master's degree, they have you do professional development at the school as a second year teacher. Then, after your third year of teaching, they make you assistant principal and dean of students. Fourth year. Fourth year. Well, oh, well, never mind. Because that was that, that was the third year. 
debt was the third year and social justice was the fourth. And was debt where you were told you didn't know what you were doing? Oh, yeah, 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 that was funny. So <laughs> I, I'm at debt and I'm having a great year, man. Uh, it's just, I had um, come back from Champaign and I'm on the west side now. I'm like, I have to put this to work. If I can't, if it doesn't work here, then it's not going to work. And so I'm having a great year. Kids are engaged, they love what they're learning. And I teach, the principal will come in and observe me, Miss Bonner, Deborah Bonner, Dr. Bonner. And I remember um, she always seemed to like what she saw, but I never got any feedback. And so one time I went down in her office and you know sat and talked to her, see what she thought. And she was like, Mr. LaRavier, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and I thought, whoa. And then she stopped and she says, well, you know what you're doing. That's not what I mean. I mean, because she heard how I took it. She said, you do all these great things, but you don't know they have a name. You don't know people have gone into classrooms and researched the things you've done and written about them and given them a name. And so you don't know how, because she would talk to me and I wouldn't be able to articulate. Said, you don't know that that's called checking for understanding. You don't know that that's wait time. You don't know that all of these best practice things that you're doing have a grounding in research. And she encouraged me to learn about that research space so that I can articulate and talk about what I do to other teachers. And this, uh, this ties into what I will address towards the end, which is just your obsession with facts. I don't know what that is, but you just seem to be completely obsessed with facts. I don't know what that's all about. Evidence. I am obsessed with evidence. I um, just can't wrap my head around it. You know, we, we, live in, we live and work in a district that is obsessed with ideology and politics, and they bring their ideology and politics. You know, there's this uh, wonderful story that I heard about this school in England called the Gordonston School. And the Gordonston School was founded by Kurt Hahn. And Kurt Hahn tells this story about uh, one of the benefactors of the school, uh, Prince Max of Germany. He would come to the school and give tours of the school. And an American came for a tour. And Prince Max is giving the American a tour of the school. And the Amer American says, what is it that you are most proud of about this school? And Prince Max says, look around you. There's nothing original here. That is what I'm most proud of. We've stolen from everywhere. <laughs> from the Boy Scouts to Plato. And the American looks at him puzzled. He said, but are you not, are you not aim for originality? And Prince Max looks at him and he says, education like medicine is based on the wisdom of a thousand years. If you go to a doctor to get your appendix taken out, and the doctor says he's going to take your appendix out in the most original manner possible, I highly recommend you go and see another doctor. And, that, and that's what happens with education. People are looking to make a dollar off of our education tax dollars. And so they come in with this ideology of innovation, that we have to try all these new things to try to get us to forget or not understand that there is an evidence base in education, like medicine. It's already been shown what works. They want to, but we have to ignore that and not be aware of it so that we can look to them for their BS solutions that they come in to make a profit off of our children. Well, no, I don't know, Troy. I don't know. <laughs> this I, it seems kind of general, Troy. I mean, you know, corporations and business in general are good at, you know, making things uh, efficient, right? Accounting. They're very good at accounting and, and, and accountability, right? So that's something that can be learned uh, by the Chicago public school system. I am so glad Troy. you said that, sir. Really? Uh, <laughs> Interesting. So, what, so they come in and say they're putting these business practices to work in education. That's not what they're doing. They would never do the kind of crap they do in education in business. They would never come into a business leading with accountability because that's the lead story in education, accountability. Accountability is always there, but it's never the lead. It's like in business, right? In business, you have two sides. You have financing and you have accounting. You don't come with your business plan focusing on accounting. Finance, you focus on finance. Finance is 
how you organize and distribute and spend your assets, how you plan to use them to generate revenue. Accounting is just keeping track of that in business, right? In education, the similarity is that they come in with this accountability, but the other side of that is capacity building. Building the capacity of your teachers to meet the standards by which you're trying to hold them accountable. Yeah. But they're trying to do on the back end with accountability what they've completely neglected on the front end with capacity building. And so if you decide to do that in business, you lead with accountability, all you'll be doing is cataloging your businesses plummeting to failure. And that's what's happening in education. <laughs> what I was asking about there. Um, so, okay, you focus on being a teacher. That Sorry. third year at the university, you get straight A's, you say, I'm devoting my life to this. You, you get out and in, in back into Chicago because you want to focus on underprivileged areas, underprivileged neighborhoods, underprivileged schools, underprivileged students. And then I read in Chicago Magazine that just came out that Blaine Elementary, where you were formerly a principal, was the number one rated neighborhood school in Chicago. And you brought it from number six? 16. Six, well, okay. well, 16 yeah. neighborhoods, 16 overall, six neighborhoods, you're right. Okay, so my point is, Blaine is in Lakeview. Probably a predominantly white area, relatively affluent, more resources than other areas of the city. Right. What drove you to make this decision to go there? So that is, that's about my mom. So there's a deep story to that. I don't know if I have time to tell, I'll tell a quick version. So like he says, I spent my entire career, uh, South Side, West Side, back to the Southwest Side, all either majority black or majority Latino schools in always low income. And that was almost a, a given. When I looked up in the bulletin for a job, I'm looking at demographics. And I had a summer where I did that, and I got into the end of a couple of processes, but and then I saw this school, Blaine, and it didn't meet any of my criteria, but for whatever reason, I put my app in. And at the same time, my mom was sick, uh, and she was passing away, and eventually she did. And I had this real deep experience with her in the hospital, and I don't have time to go into that right now, but it was like, you know, one of those experiences where you know you were put on this earth for a reason. Uh, and she kind of passed this thing to me. Uh, maybe another show for that one. You got it. We'll but, podcast it. I don't care. We'll figure but, it out. <laughs> so she passes away. We bury my mom. Uh, and, and my mom had to leave the North Side. My mother's white. And she had to leave the North Side when she got pregnant with my oldest brother, Michael. My mother told her, you cannot bring a black child into this neighborhood. This is 62. Right? This is around 1962. So um, she left. And we, we lived a life of extreme poverty. Uh, she was never employed. We did welfare our entire lives, except for the six years she was, she was married to my younger brother's father. And meanwhile, I go through the life I lived, and I, you know, I, go, I leave high school, I go to the Navy, I go through all of that, and my girlfriend convinced me to go to college. And uh, I become a teacher, and I work my way up, and I'm an assistant principal at Johnson uh, School of Excellence on the west side. I didn't even talk about Johnson. My well, I, we've was, done right. too much, Troy. So we've done too much. I am assistant principal there, and I get a call after I bury my mom from Blaine Elementary School. And I remember when they did a phone interview, and they asked me why you want to be a principal. Like, the same reason I want to be a teacher. I wanted to be a teacher. And I tell them the story, and the story, I know it's an all-white, it's a mostly white school, it's an all-white LSC. And I, I'm, one thing I don't have a problem with is honesty. You're going to get, I'm going to tell you what you're going to get. And so I told them the story. And when I got to the part about Malcolm X, I'm like, this is where the phone conversation is going to end. I read a book by Malcolm <laughs> and X. And I told the lady how Malcolm inspired me, blah, blah, blah. And then they have another person call, because they want the other person to have the same, to hear the same answers to the same question. Uh, and I tell her, Malcolm X. And then they call me again for an in-person interview. And I'm going in, and I'm driving, and I'm Go by, and I get off on Urban Park Road, I got off Lakeshore Drive on Urban Park Road, and I look up to the right, I see Thor Hospital, the last place I saw my mother alive. And I look forward, and I know I'm going to get this job. Because I'm, right now, doubtful. What am I even doing this for? Like, this is not what you got in education. 
And then I realized something that made, made me lose all doubt. And so I went through the whole interview process. I'm going to skip a lot of very funny, important stuff. Uh, I went through the whole interview process. And the race is kind of an issue. Right? It's kind of like questions like, have you ever taught in a school like ours? That kind of thing. Introduce um, you to our community. Yeah, that was, that, that, that was a question I was asked to one of my references. How do we introduce you to one of my, uh, the people in our community? How do we introduce him? If we were to hire him as principal, how would we introduce him to How would you recommend we introduce him to our community? Right? And at first I was thinking, oh, that's, that's kind of messed up. But then I thought, they're going to do the same thing my grandmother went through when she got pregnant with my oldest brother. That if they, they, they've met me and they like me, they know I'm skilled, but they know the people who elected them have how are they going to think about, what are they going to think about them bringing me into this school? Right. They have the, a decision to make. And so, long story short, we uh, get to the, and, and, and I had always thought my grandmother was a racist. Then I realized, she didn't say that to my mother because she was a racist. She said, you can't bring a black child in this community because these people will kill us. This is 1962. King was stoned in Chicago in 68, six years earlier. And so they have this decision. How are they going to respond? And so long story short, we get to the end. We're at the big event in the uh, auditorium, the uh, principal forum. It's me and one other candidate. I do my thing. The other candidate comes in and does her thing. And they put us in a room and they march me back out. And then auditorium's filled with families from the uh, community and from the school. And they do a, it's seven people. And it's supposed to be 12, and it has to be a majority of 12 that vote you in. So I need a unanimous vote. And the guy gets up and says, uh, I nominate, or I make a motion that we offer Mr. Troy LaRavia a four-year contract at Blaine Elementary. Someone second it, and they vote in. Yes, 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 yes. Mr. LaRavia, do you accept? And I said, I certainly do. And then there was this uproar. And this, the crowd stood up and applauded, and then this receiving line about 40 people deep formed in it. Welcome to Blaine. I love what you had to say about kindergarten. Welcome to Blaine. So good to have you. But my mind at this point is still on Irvin Park Road when I realized I'm going to be principal in this school. And what I realized in that moment, the, the, what I saw in that moment was that 50 years ago, my mother had, I realized where I was going. So 50 years ago, my mother had to leave the North Side because of the color of her oldest son. And now 50 years later, another one of her sons is going to be brought back to the North Side by an all-white community and given the most important responsibility you can give someone in terms of responsibility for the education and safety of their children. That made me realize I am supposed to be here. question, mm -hmm. uh, but very briefly, please, President LaRavier. <laughs> <laughs> really two questions, I think, about it. But the first question is, you were in the Navy. Yes, I was. So you should know about following orders. I should. And can you tell me very briefly why it is you were not able, as a principal of an organization, within an organization, to be able to follow orders and instead spoke out against what you thought was, like, I don't know, wrong? Yeah, I mean, I took, that, I took that attitude into my career as well. I spent my first two years at Blaine. Nobody knew who I was because that's all I did was what I was told to do. Even before that, when I was an assistant principal at Johnson, when I disagreed with my principal, only one person knew, Alice Henry, my principal. Uh, when a decision was made, we came out together. No one would have, you, I, I, I implemented like it was my idea. You know, but whether I disagree with her or not, she had good intentions. She wasn't unethical. She wasn't corrupt. We just had a different way of thinking. But as she wasn't destroying the school, she wasn't misspending funds, right? We just had a difference of opinion, and she was the leader. But when I walked into Blaine, and one decision after another from City Hall, when you see $10 million spent on furniture. Do you furniture. Remember, you remember the excuse they gave for that? They really nice furniture. Know, that moving it would be too expensive. I'm like, I got a brother-in-law that'll do it for 50,000. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when you see, 
when you see that they're corrupt, when you see they don't have the two, one decision after another and you see the contradictions between what they say and what they do and where the school system is going, then you have, there's a point at which you have to do what your heart, what your soul, what your conscience says is right. And that's what I did. Uh, last question, you gonna run for mayor? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. right now and I have a job ahead of me. And a lot of that job has to do with influencing policy, education policy, any policy that impacts the ability of our principals and teachers to ensure that students realize their full potential. But more and more, just like when I was at Patrice's house, I realized there's so much outside of school that impacts our ability to do our job that the people outside, the people in in the alderman's office, or the state rep's office, or the mayor's office, uh, are not doing correctly. You know, one of the things that impacts our ability to do our schools is whether the kids come with lead poisoning, right? Mm -hmm. And if I'm in Lincoln Park, I have a 0% chance of being exposed to lead paint. If I'm in Austin, my chances are one in four. And one in so four? One in four. And that means I'm gonna suffer from the cognitive difficulties of that. Mm -hmm. And do you know that this current administration reduced the lead paint abatement program by $3 million? $3 million? Making it much more difficult for us to do our job. So to ask your question, more and more I am beginning to see that we're going to have to be able to impact poly policy outside of schools yeah. uh, in order to do our, in order to show our kids get what they deserve. So that's a solid maybe. <laughs> trying to impact policy from the position that I'm in. <laughs> but, you know, my mind's, my mind's open. Uh, we'll see. Well, we will see because I think everyone here is very inspired by what you just said, what you do every day. <laughs> So now we're going to welcome up for the second song of the evening, Michael DeVille. Uh, we're going to set up for him now. Hey, Michael. Hi, how are you? Hey, you know, I'm going to see you again. Tony, I really like